Hello, and welcome to a public forum topic lecture on the November-December NSDA topic, The United States Strategy of Great Power Competition Produces More Benefits Than Harms. In this video, I am going to give you a basic rundown on the topic, what I think you need to know in order to succeed debating it, but in particular, we're going to cover three main things. First, we'll talk about resolutionary analysis, then we'll discuss pro arguments, and then we will discuss con arguments. So resolutionary analysis, we're going to go through five different things that I would encourage you to go through whenever you get a new topic or whenever you're looking at analyzing potential debate topics. The first thing we need to look at is trichotomy, and that is what type of topic is this? Is it a policy topic, a fact topic, or a value topic? A policy topic says that an actor should do something or an actor ought to do something or should or should not. A value says whether something is good or bad or if it's better than another thing. And then a fact topic says something is or is not something or something will be something else. So because it's not saying we should start doing or stop doing something in this topic, or asking us to evaluate the past, that makes this a value topic. Again, the topic is the United States strategy of great power competition produces more benefits than harms. So if this topic is about whether something is more good than bad, it's a value topic. That means when you affirm or when you negate, you're not changing what the United States strategy would be or pretending to change it. We're just discussing whether or not it's producing more good than it is bad. So, second step of analyzing a topic is definitions. Obviously, the phrase in this topic that is so complex is strategy of great power competition. So, a military strategy, because this topic area or this topic cycle had two options and they were shortened to the military strategy topic cycle, military strategy is the military planning and execution of ideas to achieve security goals, Great powers are the United States, Russia, and China, at least in our current world, and competition is seeking to establish superiority over one's opponent. So when we take those definitions together, great power competition is a term of art, but it borrows from each of these definitions. I would say that a really good definition of it comes from Gaines and Sinkunkin in 2020, where they say that it is an antagonistic rivalry with Russia and China in which each attempts to gain an overall advantage in economic, security, and diplomatic international affairs. And then the only other thing you might need a definition of is produces, which is the present tense of produce or cause something to happen. The fact that it says produces instead of has produced means that we're talking about the word as it is happening. So we're talking about the strategy, what has it done, what is it doing, and what will it do. So you can talk about past, present, and future uh, consequences, good or bad, of great power competition when you're writing your cases. Now that we've discussed that, let's get into the background of this resolution. So I believe that we have gone through four major strategic developments since 1947, and great power competition is the most recent of those developments. So from 1947 to 1991, our main U.S. strategy was the strategy of containment. Uh, this was primarily marked by the Cold War, which was a rivalry between the United States and its allies versus the Soviet Union and its allies. So when the Soviet Union collapsed and all the countries spread apart and we were left with Russia and a bunch of former Soviet states, that kind of ended the strategy of containment where that's all we were really focused on. Then we entered the strategy of enlargement from 1991 to 2001, where the United States was trying to expand its presence globally. We got more involved in international affairs in other countries. We tried to turn more countries into capitalist democracies. We built really big alliances like NATO, and we started engaging in peacekeeping operations. In 2001, we experienced 9-11, and 9-11, again, marked a shift in our overall strategy to counter terrorism, but also this time was marked kind of by an effort by the United States to engage in global cooperation with pretty much everyone. We were really trying to stop terrorism, but President Obama kind of argued that this was the point in time where we needed to stop focusing on who was the strongest country in the world, and instead we needed to focus on fighting climate change, fighting terrorism, fighting pandemics, because all of those were going to require cooperation. Now, the previous three strategies all basically, the first one, there were two great powers in the world. There was the United States and Russia. And then at the end of that, we lived in a mostly unipolar or one major power world. 
which meant that the United States was top dog and got pretty much whatever it wanted. But ever since around 2012, we have shifted into our current strategy, which is great power competition. Now, these strategies were marked by the victory of the current leaders of Russia and China, Vladimir Putin in 2012 for Russia, and Xi Jinping in 2013 for China, who have been in power since that time. Now, pretty much a year, a couple of years after they took power, China began expanding and being more aggressive uh, in the U.S.'s eyes by claiming territory in the South China Sea that's also claimed by countries like Japan and the Philippines. And Putin invaded uh, Ukraine and annexed Crimea all the way back in 2014. This strategy is marked by us seeing Russia and China as adversaries and rivals because now we recognize that we no longer live in that unipolar world where we are the unmatched great power. Every country is trying to establish its own sphere of influence, and the United States is trying to fight back against that by being better than Russia and China in three main areas the military, economics, and diplomacy. So our military competition means that we're trying to have the strongest military, including having the best technology, preventing the other great powers from encroaching on our territory and on the territory of our allies. We're trying to be economically competitive by having the strongest economy, the most growth, the most new jobs, the most independence where we don't need Russia or China, but we have a lot of other allies economically. And then diplomatic competition, which largely falls into the other two categories, but this is the idea that we want the strongest alliances. We want the most countries working with us and not with Russia and China. So we are forming alliances, coalitions with multiple countries, individual partnerships. We're trying to basically get exclusive deals to work with countries so that they choose us and not Russia and China. So if that's why we're debating this topic, what is the main issue at stake here? I would say that the core controversy of this resolution is, has, does, and will the United States economically, militarily, and diplomatically competing with Russia and China make the world a better place? If the answer is yes, vote pro. If the answer is no, vote con. So if you can simplify the topic down to has the U.S. competing with Russia and China made the world better or worse, that will make it really easy for your judges to understand what's going on. So who is at stake or what types of people or things are at risk when we're discussing this resolution? Well, there are a couple of groups. The first one I would say concerns America because it is the United States strategy. So our citizens, our businesses, and our military service members all stand to gain or lose from this strategy. The same thing applies to Russian and Chinese, that is a typo, citizens, businesses, military service members, as well as the political leaders, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and their underlings. Smaller nations or our allies also have a lot to lose or gain in this situation from their citizens to their businesses to their political leaders. And then also the environment, nature, and animals will probably be affected by this. The last thing I would note is that while this, this topic seems complicated, it is the basis of the entire United States foreign policy, and it has been for at least since the Trump presidency, which means understanding this topic is going to be crucial to any other foreign policy issue that you might debate for the rest of your high school career. And it's going to be important for just understanding international politics and U.S. foreign policy in future elections. So even though this topic might feel complicated, I think it's incredibly important that high school students are well informed. And I am looking forward to high school students' ability to inform adult judges who might not know something this crucial when they finally get to judge you on this topic in the coming months. So now that we've discussed the setup of the topic or what it is that we're debating, let's discuss how we're going to argue it. I have 10 ideas that the arguments that the pro can read and 10 ideas for arguments that the con can read. So all of these arguments on the pro are going to be benefits of great power competition. So they should be phrased usually as before great power competition, something bad was happening. Great power competition has helped to fix that problem and fixing that problem is really good. Or there's this problem great power competition helps solve it, that prevents a really bad thing from happening. That's how your contention should be structured, which is known as uniqueness, link, and impact. Uniqueness, what's going on in the status quo, link, what is changing or what has changed based on the topic, and impact, why does that matter? 
So the first pro argument idea that I would like to discuss is talking about Africa. These arguments are in alphabetical order, not in order of strength, although I do think that the argument about Africa uh, is really strong. So this argument says that in the status quo or before great power competition, we were mostly ignoring the continent of Africa and our foreign policy outside of counterterrorism. And China, on the other hand, was trying to build relationships with countries in Africa. They were increasing their economic investment and all sorts of stuff. Uh, so the United States is now trying to match and exceed China's involvement in Africa as a way to compete. Your argument will be for the impact. That is a good thing because now African nations have more choices over who they want to work with. Both countries have to compete to bring down the cost of deals for the African nations. It's going to improve the economy, the uh, government structure, and all sorts of stuff for nations within Africa as a continent. Another argument you could read is about the Arctic. So the Arctic is different than Antarctica. Antarctica is the one down at the bottom uh, or in the southern hemisphere, and then the Arctic is at the top or the North Pole. Uh, so the Arctic is a really important region that the United States can claim that it has a uh, claim to because it has Alaska, which is near the Arctic, and Russia is also near the Arctic, and even though China's not near the Arctic, it's increasing its activities there. So uniqueness, Russia and China are increasing their military and economic activities in the Arctic, and they've been doing so for a couple of years. So the United States needs to be able to compete with them in that area. Uh, so when we try to compete with them, we start doing the same thing. We increase our economic and military activities. And you say that is important because it guarantees that we have access to natural resources, access to shipping lanes, and that we'll be able to prevent military buildup by our adversaries. So they won't be as tempted to put military bases or missiles or things like that in the Arctic if we are also maintaining a presence there as part of our competition. Third pro argument area is climate change, which I think is a strong argument, but there's also uh, a climate change argument for the negative. This argument says that cooperation was not working to resolve climate change because international agreements don't really work. Uh, the contributions being made by the three great powers weren't going down during the time before great power competition, but great power competition encourages the United States to be better than Russia and China, but China in particular, so that we can have better solutions to climate change, like better alternative energy sources. So it creates a sort of race to the top. And the impact is stopping climate change will help us avoid mass death, suffering, and possibly even extinction. Fourth argument area is the Defense Industrial Base, or DIB. I am not a huge fan of this argument, but I am sure that people will read it, so I think that everyone should be ready to answer it at the very least, or maybe you do like it, so you want to read it. But the uniqueness argument here says that the Defense Industrial Base, or the set of companies that make weapons for the United States military, has been struggling in recent years before great power competition towards the end of the counterterrorism era because they're weren't enough new justifications for military weaponry needing to get built, so their companies weren't doing as well. Uh, and so, but when we have great power competition, we're trying to be better and stronger in our military than Russia and China, which increases military spending, helping the defense industrial base. And then the impact is that strengthening the defense industrial base or DIB helps create jobs and is good for the economy. Not a huge fan of this argument but the evidence exists, so I think that you could argue it if you wanted to. Next argument is deterrence. Deterrence is the idea of scaring other countries into not attacking us for fear of stronger retaliation, as I understand it. So the uniqueness argument here is that when we have great power competition, we're going to try and have the best military in the world. And when we have the best military or military superiority, other people are discouraged from attacking us and are discouraged from attacking our allies, which means that as long as we are competing with Russia and China and we have the strongest military, those countries will not attack us and they will not directly attack our closest allies. Sixth argument area that you could mention as the pro concerns international relations, but specifically international relations with non-Russian or Chinese countries. So you say that a lot of countries are afraid of Russia and China and want reassurance from the United States that they're there to protect them and that they're not going to let Russia and China boss them around. 
So when we have great power competition, the United States is trying to be better than Russia and China, including diplomatically, which forces us to strengthen our relationships with our allies. When our allies feel uh, strengthened in their relationship with us, they're less likely to build their own nuclear weapons. They're more likely to trade with us. They're less likely to go to war. They do what we want them to do. So it creates all of these beneficial things for the United States and for those other countries. Next argument area is public spending. This is the idea that even though this is a foreign policy topic, it also has domestic implications. Because when we're trying to be better than Russia and China militarily, economically, and diplomatically, that also encourages uh, making our efforts better at home. So when Russia and China do things like spend more money on education and healthcare to improve their domestic capabilities, we want to do the same thing to show that we as a democracy, as the United States, are better at those things than they are, which forces us to try and not fall behind in anything. And then your impact is just reasons why spending money on education, on healthcare is good. Eighth argument area for the pro is technology or tech innovation. So China and Russia are racing to develop new technologies all over the place in artificial intelligence, in cybersecurity, in biotechnology, which are the areas of this year's policy debate topic, but also in outer space, uh, in the military, in healthcare, all over the place, they're trying to develop new technology. And when we have great power competition, we're trying to be better than Russia and China at technology as well, which causes us to try and race to develop the best technology faster. So we're getting all of this innovation, all these new and exciting products that make people's lives better. And it means that we don't have to rely on Russia and China as much for parts per our technology, which is real important because if Russia and China all of a sudden decided that they didn't want to trade with us anymore, for those parts we need for technology, if we didn't try and compete to have our own domestic industries, we wouldn't have the materials we need to develop this technology. And then your impact is just any reason why the technology being developed by these races is crucial, which most people will argue that technology development is going to be crucial to solve every modern problem we experience. Ninth pro argument area is transitioning away from counterterrorism. So this says that great power competition is good because it ended the counterterrorism strategy of the United States. So the uniqueness argument is that the United States was focused on counterterrorism, but great power competition shifted us away from counterterrorism as a strategy. And then your impact is just all of the reasons why counterterrorism was a bad international strategy that it didn't work, that it was expensive, that it killed millions of innocent people, that it hurt our relationships with other countries. So this is a good one, especially because the cons arguments will not directly disprove this argument. And you can impact a way to prove that counterterrorism was so bad that the harms that might be caused by great power competition are worth it if it means getting away from the harms of the previous strategy. The tenth argument area this video will talk about for pro ideas is defending Ukraine. So this argument basically says that Russia invaded Ukraine, which we all know that happened earlier this year in February, and that great power competition prompts the United States to try and counter those efforts. We don't want Russia to gain all these military advantages. We don't want them to take away the democracies of other countries. We don't want them to encroach on our allies' territory. And so that encourages us to try and defend our allies like Ukraine and also spend more money on NATO, reassure our NATO allies, try and work with countries to prevent China from doing the same thing to Taiwan. So your argument is anything we have done in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine that has been good probably is because of our strategy of break power competition. If we didn't care about competing with Russia, it's very possible that we wouldn't have had as big of a strong international reaction to what Russia is doing. So you can say our aid to Ukraine is really good so that they can defend themselves. You could possibly impact this out to a, preventing a similar situation with uh, China and Taiwan. But essentially, if you want to talk about Ukraine, this would be a great argument to read. Third and final part of this video, we'll be talking about con arguments or the harms of great power competition. What problems is being caused by our current strategy? Remember, you don't get to argue that we should end it or that things would be better if we did. You are just trying to prove harms that have happened, are happening, and will happen because of this strategy. Again, these are in alphabetical order. The first argument you could read is authoritarianism. 
uh, or hurting democracy. Authoritarianism is a structure of government that is not really by and for the people, but rather is top down uh, and can oftentimes lead to crackdowns on human rights. There's not as much freedom to expression, all of those types of things. So the uniqueness argument for con arguments on this topic should be before great power competition, something really good was happening and then great power competition trades off with that and stops it, which is really bad. Or you should say, there's this problem happening. The problem is being caused by great power competition, and here's why that matters. So you still have that uniqueness link and impact structure, but it's different than it is on the pro. So your uniqueness argument here is that the United States is trying to compete with Russia and China by spreading democracy. Russia and China are autocracies or are autocratic styles of governments. The United States is trying to prove that they're better than Russia and China because they're a democracy. They're trying to turn other countries into democracies and trying to condemn Russia and China for not being democratic. The problem is that that actually trades off with actual democracy and makes it less likely to happen. It backfires because other countries feel like if they want to work with the United States, they have to become a democracy, whereas Russia and China don't really care what you are. So they're more likely to try and follow Russia and China's lead because there's less strings attached. It also scares Russia and China when we try to promote democracy because they think we're trying to overthrow their governments. So they crack down on democracy efforts in their own countries. And then the impact is just reasons why authoritarianism is bad. Usually it means suppressing minority rights. It's bad for human rights. It doesn't get people a voice. Any reason why democracy is good uh, would work as an impact here. Second argument area is climate change, just like on the pro, only your argument is that in the status quo, climate change is getting worse and we have to be able to cooperate to solve it, but great power competition actually hurts climate change because one, it means that the great powers don't work together to create solutions for climate change, but two, if we're so focused on having a stronger economy than Russia and China, we might be willing to do things that are bad for the environment in order to create that economic growth so that we can outcompete them. And then your impact is just, again, climate change will cause mass death and suffering, possibly even ending in extinction. <clears throat> Third argument here is counterterrorism, which is like the reverse of the terrorism argument on the pro side. The pro side says that ending our strategy of counterterrorism was good. This argument says that ending our strategy of counterterrorism is bad. So you say before great power competition, we were stamping out terrorism. It was working is what you'll argue. And then the link argument is that when we compete, we are distracting and detracting away from our counterterrorism efforts. We spend less money on it. We spend less focus on it. We don't work with Russia and China to stop terrorism. And then the impact is just reasons why terrorism is bad. It kills thousands of people. It destroys communities. It causes civil wars. Uh, it suppresses human rights, everything like that. Fourth argument is going to be gray zone or conflict in the gray zone, which is a very common argument in the literature. The gray zone is not a real place. It's a hypothetical space between war and peace. So anytime that we do something aggressive that is not an act of war against another country or they do it against us, it is aggression within the gray zone. It's not quite peace, but it's not quite war. So the con argument here is that China and Russia are increasing their aggressive activities against us probably because of great power competition. So they're cyber attacking us, they're launching disinformation campaign, they're getting in proxy wars. And a proxy war is like, instead of the United States and Russia going head to head, it's like, we give money to one group in the Saudi Arabian civil war. And then Russia gives money to the other group in Saudi Arabia for the civil war as a way to like beat the United States without attacking us. So your argument is because of great power competition, those things are happening and that it forces the United States to do the same thing and also be more aggressive in the gray zone. But the more that we increase aggression in the gray zone, the more likely it is to escalate, to turn into a real military conflict or have a really bad cyber attack on our critical infrastructure or how proxy wars will spill over. The gray zone conflict argument is the international politics equivalent of being like, I'm not touching you to like a friend or a sibling that you're trying to piss off. Fifth argument is health cooperation. So everyone knows that we've recently 
have been living through a pandemic over the past couple of years and that it's a super huge international issue. The problem is great power competition makes it something to compete over rather than something to cooperate over. And the pandemics are only going to get more and more likely as your uniqueness argument. Before great power competition, we were focused on cooperating on issues like pandemics, but great power competition as a strategy made it so that we wanted to work together less. So it discourages collaboration on solutions, like China does not want to take the United States vaccines that we've developed as part of great power competition because they see it as a way for the United States to exceed them or make them look weak. Uh, and then countries are less likely to share their vaccines, their drug technologies, uh, we won't give vaccines to some countries that working with China and vice versa. So it creates a lack of cooperation on health issues like COVID. And then the impact is just any argument as to why pandemics might be bad as proven by the COVID-19 pandemic, that it destroys economies, it kills millions of people, yada, yada, yada. Sixth argument area is about international institutions. So here with this argument, you're kind of saying this could either be combined with any of the other cooperation arguments, but it could also be its own separate argument. Your point that you're making is before this strategy, we were very focused on globalization, on let's get everyone working together to solve the biggest issues of our time. And we created all of these organizations to help us solve problems like the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, all of which we wanted the great powers to be a part of. But competition hurts the overall relationship between the United States, Russia, and China, which uh, means that we are not going to work through these international organizations and it causes splintering of our alliances. So it makes it so the organizations aren't as effective, which means we can't respond to the global issues that these international institutions were set up to respond to. Seventh is nuclear conflict. I do think this is one of, if not the strongest argument on the con. Uh, and yes, it's a nuclear war argument, which I know get frowned upon in debate, but this is quite possibly the most likely scenario for nuclear war uh, in argument form that I've seen in a debate topic in since I've been doing this activity. The argument here is that when we have great power competition, we increase the likelihood of a nuclear war because before this strategy, Russia and China, or Russia and the United States in particular, were both slowly backing down their guns, trying to decrease the number of nuclear weapons that they had. They weren't trying to build more, but competition means that we are trying to have the strongest military, so we start building more nuclear weapons, which forces Russia to build more nuclear weapons and China to build more nuclear weapons, and then other countries feel like they have to build more nuclear weapons. And the more nuclear weapons we have, the more on alert we are with our nuclear weapons, the more likely it is that we actually have a nuclear war, whether it's by accident or miscalculation or anger. And then you just say nuclear war would be really bad. It would probably kill us all through nuclear winter and things like that. Eighth con argument area is outer space cooperation. This says that before great power competition, we were trying to work together more on space exploration and development, but competition means that we're going back to how things were, you know, all years and years ago when we put the first people on the moon. So competition decreases cooperation in outer space. We're trying to get our own glory, do things by ourselves. Uh, so we're not able to develop outer space as much, but also it means that Russia and China are more likely to try and attack our satellites, and satellites are crucial. So if you remember, or if you are around for the uh, appropriation of outer space topic a couple of years ago, satellites are crucial to pretty much everything the United States does. It's where we get our military, it's where we get our climate models, it's how we get our internet, it's absolutely crucial. So if we went to war in outer space, or if we had conflict in outer space, or even just a satellite attack in outer space, it could destroy economies, it risks nuclear war and any type of war because you can't communicate as well because it takes down your communication uh, it can take down cell towers and all sorts of stuff. So you basically argue that we need to cooperate to solve issues happening in outer space, like incoming asteroids, like space junk, uh, like trying to colonize other planets, but competition makes it so we try to do it on our own and we can't solve it on our own and it makes conflict in outer space more likely. 
Ninth, uh, this is more of a critical argument if you want to read one in public forum, and if not, then stay away from this argument. But you're basically saying that great power competition rests on the idea that China and Russia are security threats to the United States. And so in order to justify all of this stuff that we're doing, we refer to China and Russia as a security threat which is really bad because when we frame them as threats, it causes them to start behaving that way. It creates this self-fulfilling prophecy and it justifies endless interventions by the United States military. It's the idea that if somebody tells you that, you know, like you're a bad kid and you're never going to amount to anything and nobody believes in you, then a lot of the times you start acting that way. And when the United States tells China and Russia or talks about China and Russia like they're a threat, then if they think we see them as a threat, then they will start trying to defend themselves, build up their defense capabilities. And then we look to their building up their military to defend themselves. And we say, see, look, they're a threat. They're preparing to attack us, which only justifies the cycle continuing over and over again. And we use it to justify any immoral or unethical action we might take against Russia and China, all in the name of trying to stop the security threat that they are, which makes a eventual war inevitable, or it expands the military industrial complex. Uh, and it increases like maybe xenophobia and hatred of Russian or Chinese people. So there's all sorts of arguments that you could read here. Tenth and finally is a trade war argument. And a trade war is currently happening between at least the United States and China and arguably between the United States and Russia as well. Before great power competition, we were very focused on globalization. We're trying to increase trade with everybody because the more we traded with people, we figured the less likely it was that we went to war with them because if our economy is dependent on theirs and vice versa, why would we want to lose that by going to war with them? The problem is great power competition makes it so that we want to be better than each other economically, so we don't want to give unfair advantages to each other. So we put sanctions and tariffs on all sorts of products from China and Russia, and they respond by doing the same thing because we would rather people buy stuff from the United States businesses than Chinese businesses. The problem is that when we increase sanctions on each other's countries, we make it so that the cost of getting good goods gets even more expensive. And so when stuff gets more expensive, that increases price inflation, which exacerbates poverty, and it hurts economic growth. It makes the likelihood of real war more likely because if we're not trading as much with Russia or China, we don't have as much to lose by going to war with them. So you argue that great power competition has created and makes the trade wars that we have with Russia and China worse. So that is all I have for this video. In this video, we talked about the resolution. The United States strategy of great power competition produces more benefits than harms. We set up the debate by talking about what are we discussing. It's when we try to be stronger militarily, economically, and diplomatically than other great powers like Russia and China. Does that make the world a better place or not? The pro has lots of arguments as to why it makes the world better, saying that there's problems that were happening before our strategy, but the strategy of great power competition or GPC is fixing that, which is really good. The con is trying to say that it produces a bunch of harms before the strategy, things were getting better, or the strategy has caused something bad to happen, and that is a problem. So that is the third part of the video, and I think that this topic has a lot of potential. I understand why it can be scary to research, but I really think that this will set you up to be so much better at other United States foreign policy topics that especially if you're a novice, I can't think of a better way to set you up for future success. So I hope that this video was helpful, and I will see you in the next one.